what are we what are we doing next? Oh, Jay Woods wrote this thing about circuit breakers. I wanted to get your guys' take on this. So there's a level one circuit breaker. It kicks in once the S&P drops 7% from the prior day. Level two is a 13%. Level three, by the way, before I get to level three, Jay said before the 2020 sell-off, the last time it was used, and it was only one time, was in October 97, the Asian financial crisis. We had four circuit breaker halt trading on four days in, in March. Level three is triggered by a 20% drop. Obviously, there was only one day where that happened, 1987. Are we ever going to see a level three drop? A level yeah, but there three? was no circuit breaker in 87. Correct. Are we ever going to see that? Uh, again, another thing that really would shock me. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it would shock me either. I mean, you know, we saw that Dow flash crash a couple of years ago. Remember your reaction where, where uh, I forget, this was like probably six years ago when you're watching, was it the Olympics? And you're like, oh, you were eating food. You're like, that's a nice goal. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Totally, it, was, it was the World Cup. Yeah, yeah, it was you, the World Cup. You were totally yeah. deadpan. That would be your reaction watching the stock market fall 20% in a day. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like the the audience that, you know, I, I think I'm writing for, you know, is just going to hold through this thing. And like, unless it's down 20% the next day and the day after that, it's like, all right, maybe we have some. I just about. remember Circuit Breaker Twitter also being insufferable. Like all of a sudden people would come out of the woodwork with all the rules and debate what counts as a trigger and I don't know. I I feel like the I feel like the uh the commentary around it should be hysterical. Like we should not have a stock market that drops seven percent in a day unless something really bad is happening. But what about like just like the idea of circuit breakers? Is anybody against or for like really bullish on yeah, circuit the liber breakers? The libertarians hate the circuit breakers. Well right. so but this is this is an interesting experiment that we're going through with Bitcoin that it could drop twenty percent right. in twenty minutes, all the leverage gets flushed immediately and then we go from there. Right. So I don't know that I necessarily want to see it in the stock market. In fact I go on record I don't. Yep. But I do think the juxtaposition between that and this is kind of interesting to watch. Circuit, bre circuit breakers are a good example of centralization being a good thing. Yep. I, 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 we think need, in, I agree. People in, would lose their f***ing mind if there's no circuit breakers. In a time yeah. of crisis. Right? What would have happened during COVID if there's no circuit breakers? In a time of crisis, somebody has to be in charge. And you could say, well, I, I think these rules and these levels from the New York Stock Exchange are preventing people from profiting. I think that's like such a minority opinion. I think most people like to know in a crisis that there is a rule that stops the endless losses and that somebody's in charge. Or, or at least just gives people a break, right? Like just to like take a breath. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, if we put it, we already have circuit breakers built in, right? Like 4 p.m. the market closes and opens back up 930. It's like you have a really shitty day. You know, the market's down 3%, 4 or 5, whatever. It's like that sucks. But at least the day ends at four o'clock and like, I'm going to have dinner with my family. I'm going to think about this. You know, I took a breath. I took a walk. You know, Botnik says I need to DCA into this thing. <laughs> I'm going, I'm, I'm buying. There we go. Well, right. You need a cool off period, which you don't have in crypto. Yeah. Although it does cool off because people are asleep, but it doesn't stop trading. So there seem to be patterns during the day where it's more active than others. And maybe those will flatten out over time. But, um, before there was a Fed and before there were circuit breakers on the exchange, there was J. Pierpont Morgan, and he was like a human circuit breaker. Like he would very deliberately show up on Wall Street and Broad in his, you know, in his horse-drawn coach. And like his mere presence, I think people like calmed down and waited to see what he would say. Right. So like we've had versions of circuit breakers even before we've had electronics, uh, which I think is good. How would you do a Bitcoin circuit breaker? Can we have a smart contract that stops all the miners and all the activity, or that would be impossible? How can I, I know? I have I have no idea. I mean, would would the Bitcoin people even want that? No, no. I I, don't. So I, I, I mean, you know, I I mean, I think one of the things about circuit breakers, right? Like you buy stocks, you get you're in the market, but you understand that this thing, this mechanism exists. Like if nobody told you that these circuit breakers were going to happen after these certain levels, then you know this is. Uh, an unexpected surprise. Whereas with Bitcoin, you know, it's just the Wild West. They don't want anybody, you know, with their hands in anything, so. Well, it is a commodity. Like, there was no circuit breaker for oil. As oil went to zero last, was that in April? Mid middle of April or something? Why aren't there, cir there's no circuit breakers on the way up. I think there's less of a chance of seeing a market go up 20% in a day than down 20%. Well, I, I completely, I don't think markets will ever go up 20% in a day. I can't imagine a scenario where that would happen. But like, what about it for individual stocks? 
to curb the mania, uh, the meme stocks, for example, should they be halted on the way up? Oh, individual stocks? Yes. No, nobody would be for that. Because like, that's like the dream come true for investors is they own a stock that's up 20% of the day. Right. There's not one person that would be in favor of that. Short sellers would be in favor of that, but short sellers don't have enough influence to, to get that done. Um, we're going to talk about, why are we talking about Bed Bath & Beyond? Because the analysts, I don't know what bank this was at, said, uh, basically set them out. I'm not playing Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin, Bed Bath & Beyond, and all these meme stocks. They're no longer trading on fundamentals. So actually, here's the quote. As a result, we moved to no rating as we believe shares of, of uh, Bed Bath & Beyond are no longer trading on fundamentals. Investors should no longer rely upon our previous investment opinion or price objective. What firm is this? This, this looks like Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Yeah, yeah, Sam, you do, you do analysts, right? Yeah. yeah. You, you know, I think it's, I think it's kind of odd. Isn't, isn't the whole idea of having a price target that's not, you know, the market price like uh, the case for saying that it's not trading at fundamentals? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, oh, this is a, and, this and B of out. B of A, yeah, B of A too. Also, like, what, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're one of the firms that you know when they do issue a price target, it's a you know quote unquote 12 month price objective. So, you know, That's are, a good point. Are, are they saying that like you know we think it, it, this is going to continue for 12, 12 months? Like, I, I don't really. Quite oh, understand. so right. What if they said ignore our price target in the short term, but by year end? We expect the stock to be trading closer to whatever. what if what if they right. said in the short term the market is a voting machine? <laughs> uh, Sam, you read a lot of or you cover a lot of sell side research, yep, right? Yeah. Have you ever seen something like this? Um, yeah, uh, there was uh, you know last year there were a handful of strategists that actually just you know uh, pulled their price targets on the S and P five hundred. I remember that, um, and that was just like super odd to me. Um, but no, this, this is not really that usual. It, it's kind of like a bold statement. Like, like, I, I think part of this is like trying to draw attention to the analysts so that, you know, when they do come back out with their price target, you know, everyone's going to cover it. Right. Maybe, what was, maybe this is someone who what was the rationale covered. for them saying, for, forget our S and P 500 year end price target. Isn't that when you need their opinions most, they yes. should, re they should resign. I, I think if like, if they can't say something constructive in that moment and their approach to like thinking about markets is to say, forget everything, like nothing we say matters. I mean, this is, this is the job of an analyst, right? I mean, you know, to yes, ignore the noise, you, you, you do, you do, you do all the fundamental, no, no, not to ignore the numbers. To, no, the to, noise, the noise. Right. Exactly. To yeah. ignore the noise and say that, you know, the, the reason why we apply fundamental analysis to this thing is because this is what we think it's worth. And, you know, over time we think this will eventually trade at that. You know, with, with these meme stocks, I feel like supply and demand are the new fundamentals. Like, and, and actually Gensler was talking yesterday about looking into some of this stuff. I don't know what regulators could possibly do here. Right. I think, I mean, I think um, one of the, uh, the links to one of these stories actually goes to a guy who, who says, uh, you know, B of A probably needs a technical analysis department. Yep. So I was thinking that, like, the analysts are trained to analyze the business. But right now, you need a stock analyst. You need somebody that or understands- Or market structure. Like, Market structure, short positions, uh, sentiment. If you're not doing that, like at a minimum, then what the hell are you talking about? Right. The private value of this business off the market if it didn't trade? Nobody needs that information. Like right. We need stock analysts. They need market internal information. GameStop has four analysts left covering the stock. There were nine in January. I'm surprised there were even nine in January. This was a tiny, basically worthless uh, business, but whatever. They've lost half their analysts with the same rationale. I think this is uh, I think this is Bloomberg. Um, Telsey Advisory Group was the latest firm to walk away from the stock, discontinuing coverage of GameStop earlier this week. Analyst Joe Feldman said the firm is always reevaluating what it makes sense to cover, <laughs> given which stocks are attracting interest from its clients. Oh, come on, Joel Feldman. Your clients aren't interested <laughs> in GameStop now because it trades 90 billion shares a day. So who... Who who is interested in this stock? The whole world. Yeah, everyone. So what are you, you know, talking about? So we have a lot of you know this sort of like um, you know quote page activity data at Yahoo Finance, and yeah, I mean the the traffic to 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 tickers like AMC and GME and the meme stocks. It's just it's unbelievable. It's you know eight times you know what people are going to see when the like eight, eight times the number of traffic that you get. Unlike the Tesla ticker. Let's sti let's wow. stipulate that that's all retail. 
right? Yep. And most pros are looking at a Bloomberg terminal. Yes. Let's do, okay, fine. You're going to tell me trades going off of 50,000 contracts at a clip, that's retail? Bullshit. No, I saw a data point Nobody last- has I saw a do- right. I saw a data point last week that 11% of the orders were odd lots for okay. one of these stocks. So the most of the money, so obviously retail lit the spark and hedge funds, et cetera, are dumping gasoline on the fire. Right. Um, but I see- Melvin Capital and somebody else, I just saw a, a report that they have combined, they had combined $6 billion worth of losses in January. <laughs> I, I see options guys on TV just openly being like, we're trading this. It, like, they don't have a fundamental opinion. They're in on the action. It's the action. It's the only game in town. Anything else on GameStop, Bed Bath & Beyond? I still like the store. <laughs> Bed uh, & Bath? Yeah, it's a great store. By the way, that- Someone should take, you know, why doesn't like, you know, Best Buy acquire them and just plug it into their business? That rally's not Best so- Best Buy we- & Beyond. That rally's not so weird to me, the Bed Bath & Beyond rally. Um, because it has a lot of short interest, but it's also the right sector. People are like fetishizing their houses. And I saw Restoration Hardware's earnings, the spike in the stock today. I think it's up 15% as we're talking or something like that. What, how did Wendy's become a mean stock, meme stock? Was that short interest? I didn't see the story there. It's super weird because the short interest is low. And the more they push that stock up, the more money they make for Nelson Peltz, who's a, who's a billionaire, <laughs> the man. who owns most of it. <laughs> so that one's- I was a big junior bacon cheeseburger guy in high school. What, what, Wendy's? Yeah. Oh, I'll f*** up some Wendy's right now. It's been, it's been, a, it's been a minute, but. And I still think they have better ch- spicy chicken sandwiches than Chick-fil-A. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the best chick, uh, spicy chicken sandwiches. Oh, there we sandwich. go. We don't need to spend much time there. I think yeah. we all agree. Right. Bow down to Wendy's I'm spicy right. chicken. It, all the listeners agree, too. I'm, um, I'm literally getting Wendy's in like an hour. 